So welcome to the last talks of the day. I'm happy to announce Trond Hirtelan with his talk on thriving in complexity. Let's uh, clap for him. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry for that trick and Norwegian name there. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy to be back at Kaninsky. Uh, my first, actually, my first talk abroad was here uh, in 2018, and uh, there is actually a connection with the talk that we did back then. That was on business capabilities, uh, which I'm not going to repeat today whatsoever. But I explained my journey towards business capabilities back then, and uh, one of the steps that I took was looking into system thinking. So this, is, this talk is basically going to be a summarized from 2018 until today about my venture into that deep, deep rabbit hole that is system thinking. Because I think we need that in order to take the extra step that we need. Uh, Eduardo sort of hinted at something that I'm going to speak about today. Because I think, uh, if, for those of you who went to his talk, he showed you how far we can get. But there's, a still a, there's, there's something missing still. And I think in order to get there, we actually have to date and do some radical rethinking of how you do this stuff. And I think the only way to do that is to look into system thinking, or at least one way of going, going, attacking that problem. So, um, and not only system thinking, but also uh, specifically social sciences, well, uh, or the system thinking that came out of the social sciences. I, I assume most of you are STEM, sir, like me, coming from natural sciences or uh, engineering or something. How many social scientists are in the room? Oh, there's two. Hopefully, I don't push your, <laughs> your, 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 your topics here because I am I'm not trained in social science whatsoever. I just read a bunch of papers. That's basically what I've done. But I'm trying to learn. So I'm still on my journey. So this is where I'm at at the moment. Um, and I actually want, want to, uh, this is going to be a heavy, quite theor theoretical, this talk. Uh, and there was a famous uh, philosopher called Kant, which you probably well know. He said that experience, experience without theory, theory is blind. Because I, I think in order to take this leap, we need to actually take on a different worldview. We can't continue where we are at the moment. We need to rethink like fundamentally something completely different. And you have a German word, I'm probably going to butcher this completely, Weltanschauung, right? Because I think that we have a similar word in Norwegian, because of course we, as Norwegians and German, likes to put words together and create new words. We do that in Norway as well. So, because that makes it more precise. So worldview is an English term for it, but it's not as precise. But let's stick with worldview, I'm not going to try to repeat that German word for your own sakes. So I think we need to sort of, because theory and even philosophy to a certain extent colors everything we do. It sort of gives us the lenses that we see the world through. And I think we need to readjust those lenses, so to speak. And in order to thrive in complexity, that's the sort of the outcome of this case. Speaking of Norway, I used this, uh, I used this before to illustrate complexity in a way. And also to show something that one of the prides of Norway for two things. This is a Norwegian artist called Christian Krog. This picture depicts the Vikings, specifically Leiv Eriksson, when he discovers America. This is sort of the, what it, this illustrates. And, 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 and what it shows for me is that we are really good at complexity. We even travel the seas to figure out new places. We venture into the unknown. And sailing is probably one of the most complex things we can do. Even so much so that the name for cybernetics, one of the first uh, system thinking uh, branches, if you like, comes from the name of that yellow character there, Leiv Eriksson, then, in this specific. He's holding the tiller, so he's the steering man. Cybernetics comes from Kubernetes, which you all already know, which is the steering man, the helmsman of a boat. So there's a double layer here. It's not Kubernetes, but cybernetics, of course, in this sense. But a little bit more mundane example. Sorry, I just have to look how it looks. The slide looks good. Okay, good. And a little bit more mundane example about how we deal with complexity. We even enjoy it. How many of you have thrown a kids' party at home? I, I guess you all feel me. This is something that, oh, we're going to plan this fantastic party. The kids are going to have such a great time. And of course they do, but not by your plan. <laughs> Right. Your plan is out the window as soon as the kids enter the door. They are having the time of their life, but you are sort of just damage control from that on. But they're having the best times ever, and you are so happy afterwards seeing that lovely kid smiling yeah, forever. 
enjoying himself to sleep, so to, so to speak, that night. So we, enjoy, we actually enjoy living in the complexity. And I can't, seriously, I can't think of any more thing more complex than holding a birthday party at home. Why I've started outsourcing it gladly <laughs> to somebody else. So I've, I pay good money for others to do that next time. So why does this stop at the office door? That's my question. Certainly, when we went into the office, we see something like this. We want to have order, structure, predictability, and certainty doesn't exist in that world. We can't deal with it. But isn't that an illusion of control? Right? So when, when I actually, that has to be a little bit personal, because it, as I said, I come from natural sciences myself, studied physics all my life before I started into IT in 99. So I was deep steeped in this, predict so the all the predictability, the determinism, right? The linear thinking, the, and all that stuff. I was so in and deep in that. So when I started looking into social science, it was like an awakening for me. I actually had to I met myself in the, I had to look myself in the mirror. Have I got this so wrong for so many years? And I actually think I have. I th there is no order. Complexity doesn't give you any order. And we live in complexity. So this model of the machine, I, I, I warned you I'm going to be a little bit uh, philosophical today, so I'm going to actually go so far to say, look in this, to, to these worldviews, as I mentioned. So I'm going to draw upon something that uh, um, a philosopher called uh, Pepper, Stephen Pepper, yes. He drew up a paper in 1942 about, he des described a set of worldviews, different worldviews that we could have. And this one is the machine, the mechanism. That's one way to look at the world. I mean, we did that. We, done, we do that in science. That is basically science for us, right? Just remember Newton, he looked at the whole, whole universe as, as, as a clock. And people talk about super determinism. So there, you see, there's all this. This is the machine. It's predictable. There are parts, there are holes, but it's very predictable. Easy to see what's going to happen next, right? So that's one of the worldviews that he looked into. Oops, sorry. And this guy has been mentioned a few times before. And this is going to be a ache of galore. A couple of slides, so be warned. Because there's a lot of memorable quotes from him. And this is probably one of the most famous ones. Which is really good. This is insightful. And he, he says that we need to take the step out of the machine model into the system age, or machine age into the system age. He says that he, he repeats that a lot. He also says this, which is another point of view of the same thing. I think Eduardo used that uh, quote as well, or me, 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 Mikael used that quote. This was also an aha moment for me when I read that, and I started thinking, what is he trying to say here? And then he said it, analysis is not enough. And I do analysis all day long. <laughs> and only that. And then he, the, the argument is that we need to take the bigger view, we need to see the containing whole, and we need to sort of, so we need to synthesize, that's what his argument is. He also takes it further and takes this from the hard system, like the machine-like model, to a soft system with people in it. So he says an organization is a system, uh, and the performance of a system depends more on how the parts interact than on how they act when taken separately. So he bring, he's, he's actually bringing into some soft parts here. Uh, actually, that is a, that's a sort of called soft system thinking, by the way. Sorry. And, and his attempt is to create a new version of operational research. That was his sort of goal then. And in doing that, he also defined four system types. Not real views, again, but system types, based on his perspective of the world. The parts and the whole and all that. So, and doing that, he worked with a guy called Fred Emery, which we're going to come back to later on. He was an Australian social scientist, very much known in the social, social science space, one of the, probably the greatest social science thinker of his day. He worked with the Tavistock Institute in London and did a lot of research on organizational design, for example. And they two, two together wrote a book called On Purposeful System, which is not this book, obviously, but the thing I'm taking here is from that book. But again, they're looking into systems from the, the purposefulness of it and define them in different types. So the first one, you probably recognize, the deterministic system, that's the machine. 
So here the parts have no purpose, and the hole doesn't have a purpose. I guess the car doesn't have a purpose yet. <laughs> it might do at some point, but today it doesn't, right? It needs something else to give it purpose. We give it purpose. The use of the machine, it gives it purpose. And then there's another level. This is an esoteric key. There's animated type of systems, like you and me. We are animated systems. We as a, the whole has a purpose. We want something out of life. There's something that we need to achieve, we want to achieve. Some more than others, so to speak. But, but again, the parts doesn't have a purpose. Your heart doesn't have a purpose. Your lungs doesn't have a purpose. It has a function, but it doesn't have a purpose. That's the difference. A purpose is something that you want, and you, want, and you can easily adjust your way there, because that's what purposefulness is. There's, a, there's something that you want to achieve. And your heart doesn't have that. And then there's another level. You probably saw this coming. That's the social system. There you are part of a team, so you are then, by definition, a purposeful system within that social team. So your parts have a purpose, and the team as it's as a whole has a purpose. I hope so. If not, then you're probably a not terrible team, but a dysfunctional team if you don't have a shared purpose. You probably wouldn't have that. And just to finish the, the sort of topology, he also introduces the ecological level. Which, which incidentally, the parts have purpose, like humankind, but the whole doesn't have a purpose. There's no, unfortunately, no central purpose to us as a humankind. So if we bring back this illustration, this means that the parts have people in it. And that changed that model quite considerably. So you're moving from a deterministic system actually to a social system if you have a team. And that changes things quite radically. And then we move into, uh, we move actually from natural sciences into social sciences here. And then we also need to take on a different worldview. We can't use the machine anymore. Because there's people there, right? And they are purposeful and they are, yeah. So then we bring on the next uh, worldview that Pepper described, which was organicism. <laughs> I had a hard time pronouncing that. Organicism. That we view the thing as an organism, right? If you remember, for example, at, at the company, we always talk about the corporate world, corpus. Again, we use the organism's uh, worldview on it. And, the, and the, I didn't mention that, but the, the mechanism, of course, the root metaphor there is the machine, the parts, and the holes. Right? That's the mechanism. In organicism, it's the interaction between things that's important. You remember back to Eikos' first quote? product of the interaction, that's when interaction becomes important, not just the part themselves. So that's the organisms. So uh, let's get a little more concrete. I've been very theoretical now. Let's see how this can play out. Say that you have a team, and you want this team want to uh, uh, accomplish something. Then they can't be equals. They need to be differentiated, because they want to achieve something that's more than some of its parts. And in order to do that, so we basically then have created a semi-autonomous team, so our self-managing team, if you like. Just to go with me here. <laughs> Say if you're creating an agile team, for example. You would give them a purpose, or they would take a purpose, even better. They were given a minimal set of specif specification to do this, because they were the experts. They're going to do this themselves. They would design themselves. They were like a participative design. They would do it like a democracy, if you like. They would have all the power and authority to do whatever they like, because they are autonomous, right? remember? They have variance control. Nobody else helps them with, with any changes in the environment or whatever happens to them. They are in full control themselves. Nobody else helps them. And in order to do that, they need to have all the information they can get hold of. Nobody else controls that information flow. They also want to be sort of uh, resilient. So if somebody has to leave or somebody gets sick or whatever, they want to be able to compensate with that. So they need monthly functionality. Each part has to be able to do more than one thing. Or each person has to do more than one thing. They want to be supported by the rest of the organization if they're in, say, in a, 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 some sort of enterprise or whatever. And they have actually requirements of their own, not just as a team, but as individuals in the team. They have, inter they have motivators that drives them both external, like pay, but also internal motivators. You probably know Pink's the three. We're going to go back to that later on, just, just a second. And of course, they never finish with this. 
this sounds like a good Agile setup, right? This is something that we want Agile teams to be. The thing is, this has come from social sciences. This comes from the 60s. Late 60s, these were principles were designed, defined. So this is a social, social technical system design as defined in the 60s. So the idea here was that, uh, again, taking the organism's viewpoint point of view, the human are an extension of the machine. They are not the extension, uh, no, they are not, uh, sorry. The humans are complementing the tech. They are not an extension of the machine. And they want to liberate people from the mechanism of the old, the old world. They want to bring humanity back into work and, and give them control. So they are, they are not machine parts anymore. They are purposeful systems. So it's basically democratization of work, in a way. Just a little sidestep here, I'm going to go back to this later on. But each, as I said, each individual has some intrinsic motivators. So we're not looking at pay and stuff like that now. We're not looking at intrinsic motivators. What drives them? It says humans. They need a certain amount of elbow room. Autonomy, if you like. They need a certain amount of variety. They want, they want to do more than just the same job every day. They want to have some variety in it. They want to have continuous learning in their job. They want their job to feel meaningful. They want their mutual support from the rest of the organization, for the, for the teammates, and probably also the uh, social, society, social system as a whole. And they want the job to lead to a desirable future. This reminds you probably of Pink's mastery, purpose, and autonomy. But this goes further. Again, social sciences in the 60s. These were called the six uh, psychological work requirements that people need, the intrinsic motivators that we have in order to enjoy our work. I'm going to go back to this later on because they actually make, there is a certain point I'm going to make with this later on. So this is all social sciences. So it's sciences. It's not something that a bunch of dudes in a ski lodge came up with. This is action research done at actual companies since the late 50s. So for those of you who don't know action research, the social scientists maybe know of it is, how this works, is that you do research, real research at the companies. For example, if you do organizational research, you do it at the companies. You don't sit at the university and just do experiment. You actually go out and do experiments with the companies. You try out things. And uh, one of the biggest experiments that I did was actually in Norway, in what they call the Industrial Democracy Program, where they tested out new ways of organizing work on real uh, critical companies in Norway. And that's, that's how they came to these this principle, principles that I showed earlier. <clears throat> so in the 60s, late, uh, early 70s, this was sort of the status quo. You see these, these uh, social parts, and there are uh, technical parts, and they have to interact and jointly optimize, as they call it. But then something happened after that. As I mentioned, you remember that Fred Emery guy that I mentioned? He wrote that book with Russell Lakoff on purposeful system. He was a social scientist, and he's also an amazing system thinker. And he was very much inspired by what's called open system theory. So he, after this, this social technical system design uh, work, he went back to Australia, continues his work, and went more into open systems theory. And this is where I think we need to go. So that's why Eduardo sort of <laughs> sold me out. I'm going to talk about open systems today, because that is where I'm, I want to take you. So let's... Um, oh, you want to? Yeah. Just a little more heads up first. Uh, as we showed earlier, we, 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 we did with Akoff, when he talks about these things, you can see that it can be an organism, it can even be a machine, but he doesn't talk about any environment at all. He touches upon it in the purposefulness, because they're talking about people, you know that people have an environment they are part of, they are part of, of a community or whatever it is. So it, it is there, but he's not being explicit about it. And Eikhoff never went there. He stopped with that book with uh, Fred Emery. So what Fred Emery did was taken into look into hmm, this open system thing. Let's look at uh, the open systems. What, what, what can it mean? What, what if we contextualize the environment? What happens then? So, so as a social scientist, he often learned a lot from the psychiatrists. And this is Andreas Angeal, angel, 
His name is uh, I said it to. He was an uh, he was an American, but he came from Transylvania, as far as I know. American psychiatrist. He was part of the, the Gestalt psychology movement at the, at the turn of the century, uh, early in 1900s. So that quote, let me read it out to you, to look into that. The biosphere, by the way, I think he actually was the person who defined the biosphere term, includes both the individual and the environment, not as inter interacting parts, not as constituents which are independent existence, but as aspect of a single reality which can be separated only by abstraction. It's a very academic <laughs> sentence, I must say. But if you look at what he's saying here, what he's actually, if you summarize it, he says that a system and an environment can't be separated. They are one and one and the same. So a system can't be understood unless you see it in, in, in the context of its environment. And if you do, then you abstract. You create an abstraction. And as EDDs, we know what creating abstractions means, right? So. You see what he's getting at here. So you're taking away something very important if you ignore the environment. That's the his idea. Uh, you know what? I haven't got time for this analogy, but uh, it's just a lovely little uh, uh, children's book that I loved reading for my son. He loved it. And just to illustrate that kids know and understand what these, these things are about. This book is, he, he's sort of wondering where does he end and where does the world as large starts? Is there a hard border between it? And he sort of figure out that it's there, there isn't. So that's it. I've got time. Sorry. But let's go back to this. So, this team, they're exposed to an environment. And if you take away the environment, you don't understand the system. And if you don't understand the system, you don't understand the team. You don't understand how the team works. How, to, how it's going to operate. You have to create an abstraction that doesn't work, because we know that environments are important to a team. So, we, uh, so what we often do, I find, is that we create closed systems. And we do that because it's easier to deal with. Because, of course, as the uh, title alluded to, when you open it up, it becomes complex immediately. There's no predictability. It's highly unpredictable. And that's uncomfortable, right? But I think we can thrive in complexity. I'm going to try to get into that. So even more theory then. This is from Fred Emery again, <clears throat> or the Emery's, so to speak. So they view the system, as you see it here. Ooh, does this work? No, it doesn't work. Anyway, you see the system there, the, 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 the large circle. And that's affected by the environment, but it also affects the environment. It's not a one-way interaction this. Is it they are co-determinative, as, uh, as they call it. And there are different types of environment. There are the closed environment, and there's the extended field. So if you work in a company, thinking, well, we need to do some strategic planning. You probably only see looking at the task environment. You're looking at the competition. You don't look further out than that. So it's kind of open, but not fully open in that sense. So then we move into the fourth definition that uh, Pepper and Ashley did. It's the third that I described here today. We had mechanism and we had organism, and now it's contextualism is the fourth one. And there the root metaphor is context, events, what has led to this system being what it is, and what will lead it to be something that it will become. And how does it look here, right now, in this context? We probably recognize this from domain driven design, don't we? So it resonates at least with me when I came across that the first time. And what Fred Emery then actually did, okay, let's look at uh, von Bertelland, he is probably the most well-known open system thinker. He was a biologist, so he looked at how does an organism survive, and it has to be open to an environment in order to survive. It needs to get energy from the environment, and needs to interact with the environment in order to survive. So, he, so they took that, but he didn't conceptualize the environment, it was just there, there was nothing specific about it. So what they did, or Fred Emery and Eric Trist to be specific, they wrote a paper about causal texture, as they call it. But that actually means translated as contextual environments. What sort of environments do we have? They defined four. I'm just going to ignore the first one, because that's basically theoretical. But the second one, which is listed here, they have a weird name for it, but just look at them at the name. Placid clustered, they call it. And the type of, that's the type of environment where there's enough for everybody. It's neutral, there's no good or bad in it. It's static, and you only need tactics to survive. 
this is the world of surplusness. There's ev enough for everybody. Just enjoy yourself, <laughs> right? There's no competition here. So that's one environment. And then I defined the third one, which is what they call disturbed reactive. And here things change a bit. There's scarcity all of a sudden, which leads to competition because people fight over the same resources. And not people I'm talking resources, I'm talking about things there, by the way. And it's dynamic because when there's competition, things change in the environment. So you can't predict necessarily unless you understand and can be actually active in it. And the strategy is that needed. This is probably what we're used to today in a competitive environment. But interestingly enough, they defined a fourth one, which they call turbulence. You still have scarcity, you still a competition, and it's still very, very dynamic, but it's unpredictable in addition. And by that I mean this, uh, the environment itself changes in an unpredictable manner. There's no way that you can predict what's going to happen in this environment. And they also uh, put them in context when, when we're different environments are sort of dominant. They also put uh, date, dates on them. The first one was dominant before the Industrial Revolution and then back to the earliest days of mankind. That's how they saw it. There was no competition before that, real competition before that. And then in the industrial uh, sort of area, uh, up until the, uh, the end of the war, you have type 3 was dominant. That's the, uh, you probably recognize, that's why it's, you, you recognize it, because that's where we're living in, mostly. But after the war, something happened. They had some different reasons for why that happened, but I'm not going into that, but just go with me and say that something happened after the war, which made it more turbulent, or more complex, if you like. Yes, so they define these environments, and then they also, based on the research in social technical system design, they also see that there are different types of organizations. They, they call them DP1 and DP2, design principle one, design principle two, so it's not inventive terms there. They're not, being, they're not selling things, they're just calling what it is. So the first one, so these are genotypical. This is the, sort of the, if you boil it down to basic forms, these are the two that they identified. And they're based on the, that inside, but you say on top, that's based on the redundancy. Uh, that, that this organization needs. So the first one, they are based on reduction, uh, redundancy of parts. That's where when you want to do something, you want to reduce the parts to be as simple as possible so you can easily replace it. And if you're going to make it as uh, simple as possible, say people, you want to division their labor as much as possible. So you can easily replace them cheaply. And if you do that, then of course the parts doesn't know how, what's going on on a bigger scale, so they need supervision. So there's a level above, the S1, and they probably need supervision, and the S2, and you probably recognize this as the bureaucracy. This is the classical bureaucracy, or autocracy even. There's somebody, up, at least one level above, that controls things beneath it. That's deeper one. So uh, here, the people, of course, if you take a, a, an organization, people are uh, cogs, or resources, as we are often called. This is a highly competitive environment because people fight for the same. If you want a career, you want to move up, and then you fight with your peers. And, yeah. and those above don't want the, the ones below getting up. Yeah, and there's a lot of dysfunctions here. There's power play politics and all that. People get complacent, alienated, frustrated, which then gives you lower quality, a, lot of, a lower productivity. This is what I found out during the experiments, as I mentioned earlier. And they also give a very low score on the psychological requirements, as I mentioned. At least at the bottom. And this is interesting. At the bottom, you got a very low score on all the requirements. Well, it's good the higher you get. At the top, it's perfect. No wonder, right? And they actually say that in this organization, everybody is ir irresponsible, apart from the one at the top. <laughs> the one at the top is responsible. But the other ones are irresponsible. So that's the DP1. So that's Taylorism for you. And then the second one, which is something that we haven't, I, I, I suspect that none of you actually have worked in a true DP2 environment. But they, 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 this is what I discovered in social technical system design research, that teams are self-organized. So these, these are the, the DP2. So here instead, you have, you have uh, the uh, redundancy of functions. So every part in the system, say your team, needs to be able to do more than one thing. So you can compensate for each other if somebody get lost or whatever. And then the control and the goal setting 
and the coordination are moved not from the supervisors down to the teams themselves. There are no supervisors anymore. There are no managers, if you like. Right? You're at the team level. This means that people are uh, certainly assets, they're not resources anymore, because these are the people you want. There's inherent collaboration, because you want to achieve the same thing together. There's trust. It's motivating, it motivates people, it commits people, because they are part of that journey themselves. And it gives actually higher quality and productivity. And this is not just a theoretical exercise, this is based on research again. This is what it has shown then. And this brings about high scores on the psychological requirements for everyone, pretty much. So, but there are exactly, and said there were two, but there's exactly a third one. And that is when there's neither of these. <laughs> there's, there's no structure, there's no control, there's no coordination. And that happens more often than you think. So this is what they, then you end up with something that they call laissez-faire, anything else. Uh, there is, there, as I said, there is no control. This is the structurelessness that people uh, complains about in different ways of working. So let's map these up to these uh, or environments, because this, the, uh, these are actually linked. Where does which type of organization uh, works best or is most prevalent in which type of environment? Probably no surprise, this is where DP2 belongs or at least thrived. The small groups, the egalitarian groups, as I said in the hunter-gatherers days, just make a little bit fun but this is what you can imagine, right? And this one is definitely DP1, industrialization. That's where we need order, we need bureaucracy, and everybody must control the la-la-la. And this is the type of organization I worked with all of my life. Or rather, I actually work with this type of organization, to be honest. And this is the either or. It's neither DP1, it's neither DP1 or DP2. It's the mix thing, where there is somebody at the top that thinks they're in control, and then people suddenly self organize at the bottom. Stupid numb nuts. Right? They ruin everything. So this brings about laissez faire. And do you recognize that you're probably more in that than that? Because I think very few of us actually have worked in either DP2 or DP1, really, to be honest. We are mostly useful, used to work in that sort of odd transition phase. Safe. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> um, so, what open system theory, go back to that uh, from framework. The, uh, the theoretical foundation is to help people move from that type of organization to that type of organization. Or not that, actually. You want to move to that. A new DP2. It's not the same as the old DP2, because it's a new context, it's a new environment. But we need to figure out a better way to work like you can achieve that DP2 type of styles. So what's the difference between these, then? You could probably see some interesting aspects between these. i just pick a few. So here you have a complex organization with simple jobs. That's the definition of what a hierarchy is. The other one, you have a simple organization with complex jobs. You need to know a lot of things in order to get your job done. You can't just know just one simple thing. This one is more closed, this is more open. This is actually very open. Variety is not appreciated in the hierarchy. Change is not good. <laughs> oh, you came up with this brilliant idea, now we're going to make sure that this is not going to happen, because this risks our investments and God knows what. So variety decreasing, it doesn't want to learn. This one is variety increasing, you want to learn. Because every mistake that happens, you want to figure out why that happened. This one, you just want to send it to somebody else. Send it up the chain probably, and somebody has to send it down, back down again. And yeah. So this, is, this creates a learning organization, but this does not necessarily. So this is encourage learning, this does not. And also, I talked to Barry O'Reilly, for those of you who know, he's a complex, complexity science. I didn't say it in the beginning, because obviously I haven't talked about complexity science yet. I'm not going to either, because I come from a different style of system thinking here. But when I talked to him, so complexity is a thinker, and he agreed, he noted when I said, this is fragile, and this is resilient. 
these, this is built to do some specific thing. Any change that they might have in context, it, it shatters. So it, you end up creating more bureaucracy often when there's, there's like push against the bureaucracy. This does not. This just create new teams or restructure or whatever. But as I said, the, the, uh, the Kant quote that I had earlier, there is a second term to that. But theory without experience is a mere intellectual play. So you could claim that what I've done so far is that. So this is so good, because open system theory also in, takes in how would you do that transition? What sort of practices are, can you do to do this? And this, uh, this is where I think we seriously need to take a good look. So open system theory talks about a two-stage model. Oh, sorry, I actually had that slide, sorry. So they talk about the two-stage model, which is defined by this one, the first one, which is called the search conference which is basically a way where for the system to understand its environment. Not only understand it, but also affecting planning in it, changing the environment. So you can't sit uh, passively adaptive to the environment, you need to actually make changes to the environment so you get to where you want it to, be, to go. And you can't just stop with your competition, you need to go further. You need to take in, because you are actually wholly open. When, you people, when you go to work, you go to work as you, not as Linda at aisle five, right? You come as you, the whole you. And that changes every day and all the time. So you can't ignore the wider environment either. So, that you, need, so you need both personal learning, as they call it, and ad ad active adaptive planning, as they call it. So that's the search conference. That's a technique to do that. And then, when you have done that search and understood where you want to be and what, uh, what you want to be and what you're going to be and uh, all that stuff, you have, you have to be able to operationalize this. And then they define something they call participative design workshops. This is how you create these self-organizing, self-managing teams, techniques for doing that. And that actually comes back to the psychological requirements, because before you even start a participative design workshop, think of it as, as a workshop where people that want to work together get together and decide how they're going to design the work for themselves. Nobody else is helping them, they're doing it themselves. And it's, the first thing you do is measure the psychological requirements. That's probably going to be terrible because they come from a DP1 type of organization often when you do this. And then you may even measure it later on to see if you have improved. And yes, the classical question, I probably would get that if, we had, if I have time for questions today, is that how long would this take then? The search conference is estimated for two days. Two long days, I must admit, but it's two days. You get off site. You work for two days. If it's a large company, complex company, maybe longer, but it's two days. And then you do the participant design workshops. They take maybe a day each, but you do many of them. So you wouldn't, this wouldn't take years. It would take months, maybe even weeks for small companies in actual time. But the lead time to before you get started with this, the search conference and all that, you need to anchor, of course, that you actually want to move, and that takes a long time. And that's probably where we, that's the tricky bit that I don't think we have quite solved yet. As the researchers say, the people that come to them where they've done this transition, they are in dire straits. They need to do something or they're going to go under. So it's a, it's a sense of extreme sense of urgency before people actually, organizations decide to do this. Um, just want to see if I have time. Yeah, I'm going to be quick on this as well. Just a little bit more detail on how you do that because it sounds a bit abstract, the whole thing. Uh, so here you have sort of the steps that you want to go through uh, during a, um, a search conference. A search conference would be about 20, 50 people. So if you're a small company, everybody would join in, because it actually doesn't scale beyond 50-ish or something like that. If you're a larger company, you would select, uh, there would be a selection of people from the organization that would take part of this. Then this is not only the C-level, mind you. Everybody that's part of the operational uh, value stream of, of a company has to take part in this, have to be represented at least. So as I said, it takes normally two days, and you alternate between groups and uh, community uh, uh, sort of work. Um, and you would then start, yeah, oh yeah, let me be clear about that. Everything in this two-step, um, the two-stage model, it has to be run as deeper too. As I say, organizations are not just the things that you work in is anything you do. If you do a workshop, you can choose, choose between DP1 and DP2. Like an open space workshop is definitely a DP2. 
this type of conference where I talk to you and you listen to me and I'm the expert and that, that's DP1. So you just be mindful of that. When you do the transition, you have to do it as a DP2 style. If not, it's not going to work. And they have a high focus on to create this sense of community because actually the first search conference was done in 16, uh, 59 by Actrist and uh, Fred Emery. Um, and they did it because there were two companies that wanted to join. So they need to figure out what's our common future, how are we going to be and all that because we are, when you have sort of joined, when you have had a merger. So you need to create that common we as early as possible. So they designed this workshop based on that need. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to be uh, you're going to look way into the future. How is it going to host, host? Not how you are going to, but how is the future going to look like in like five to six years? Ignoring where you are, where you come from, but how, what is the world going to look like? Because then you are at the same level. There is no the hierarchy isn't there anymore. Every, every voice has, has a sort of a say in that. Because this is, and if you do this properly, you have to have, even you have this something they call ideal seeking. You're not only purposeful, but you want to see the better world out of this. But you have to start with that. That's the first thing you do. So the community will start forming already then. And then you're going to start learning about your own system. Where are we? Where do we come from? So now you're back to the real life they left. And it, here's important that it's not personal stories that counts. It's the system that counts. So uh, if you felt like this was a perfect place to work and I had fun, that's your opinion, but somebody else could have a very different opinion. So this is, this is something that you probably would do in, as a community. You wouldn't do it in groups, for example. Yes. Let's go into that. The next phase, phase three. Then you look at the, your current, current system. What can we keep and what can we drop? And what is our most desirable future for us? based on what we were, where we want to go, and how can we become that. So that's highly contextual. It's very specific to your specific organization. So hopefully, by this time, you could, the community has sort of formed. You all agree on this is what we want to be. Again, this is not sea level sitting in a conference somewhere and dreaming this up. This is the company themselves doing it. And then you go to phase four, so the, the integration. Then you look into the action plans. The, so the, basically, the strategic planning. What sort of things do we have to do in the move in that direction? So it's not a roadmap. It's just a where, what do we want to be, and how are we going to be able to become that? That is what you do here. And maybe even you discover, oh, we need to do another search. This doesn't, we have to go back again and do, a, do a, another one. So that can also be an outcome of this. And then stage two. Because this is really important. You don't want to do the search conference and then move back into a DP1 type of organization and at least operationalize that in that type of organization. I don't know many of you have been part of a workshop that really uh, energized you, like an event stomachs workshop, for example. It was really fun, exciting, this was so cool, and we're going to change the world. And then you go back to <laughs> sit down by your computer and then, yeah, you're back in DP1 again. It's really hard to do this. You have to continue what you started in, in the search conference in your everyday work. So you ne often you need to reorganize after you've done this. Some probably have, may have already reorganized, and then you just have to like, get going. But most people have to do that, participate in the design workshop of your full organization. So what could this organization look like then when you've done this? These are things, uh, do you remember that illustration, Have a less affair? There was not some groups at the bottom and there was a hierarchy above. It's not that. But it looks actually surprisingly similar. <laughs> this is uh, just a, sort of a summary of, of some of the, the, uh, the things that have been done in different companies, specifically in Australia, I think they have done a few of these. So you have an operation level. That's the teams that we are used to denying. But there's team everywhere, all the way to the top. And in medium to large companies, you'd have three levels normally. But these are all teams. These are not personal dominance anymore. So you have to move from a, from a, from a hierarchy of personal dominance to a, to a collection of self-managing teams in, a, in, a, in a, um, a hierarchy of functions, if you like. Right? Operational level, they have their goals and their time span, if you like. You have another level, they have their productive goals 
and at different time span because they work on across. And now at the top, you probably have a strategic level that works two years, and maybe all of that. They have also their productive goals. So there's no power hierarchy anymore. This, that's why they illustrate this with the double lines. So <laughs> these are the scientists. I'm, <laughs> I'm bad at doing drawings, but these are, yeah. Anyway, they are probably more precise than mine, so to speak. But so that what they try to illustrate, you, you, are, you, are, you are sort of, um, you are negotiating what you're going to do next as peers. There's no power hierarchy here. So if there's, say there's a team at the bottom level, it's like, oh, there's a change in the environment now. The, the customers are not interested in our product anymore. They, they want something different. But we need to share, in order to do that, we need to change something else, something in another team. How are we going to do that? Then you need to negotiate with that team, or maybe even go one higher up. Now we need to rethink our strategies. So you see, there's no negotiations are through the whole organization. There's no sending things escalating, for example, it doesn't exist in this environment. Yes, I'm coming to an end. Um, I, th I think this, this, actually, this is from social technical system design. Okay, <laughs> so it's not open system theory, but I think it summarizes the, the movement, if you like, that the way of thinking quite well. SDS design was intended to, to produce a win-win-win-win. <laughs> Human being, uh, beings were uh, are more committed. I'm going to read from here instead. Technology operates closer to its potential. An organization performs better overall while adapting more readily to change in the, in the environment. This is actually a subtle difference between SDS and OST, because they only adapt to the environment. But the open system theory, they actually want to change the environment in order to adapt. So they are actively adaptive. It's a subtle difference, but it's actually quite profound. And just a shout out to the researchers that I read many papers by lately. This is uh, Fred Emery and his partner, Marilyn Emery. Fred sadly died in 97, but he's led a massive amount of work, many of which are available at that address, which is the, has the coolest domain name. <laughs> Social sciences that actually works. <laughs> yeah, so they are a bit of a, they are, they're not fringe, but they are a bit of the opinionated side of the social sciences. But I want to summarize their thinking, and there's some good quotes from specifically Marilyn. Now. She's actually still alive, uh, uh, but she's, she's uh, closing to her end. She's 80s plus something, and her health are deteriorating, but she's still very active. I have con uh, have contact with her, and she's written papers that's last that has been during the spring and trying to push this through the journals. So that's impressive. But this quote, it says a lot about her as well, though. As soon as people are forced to compete, they have to look uh, after their own interest. And so self-interest comes to dominate in the DP1, which is the autocratic or bureaucratic structure. All the team building in the world won't change that dynamic. And this is quite interesting, because we talk about a lot of things that we, need, we want to change. We want to create psychological safety, for example. We want people to be more agile. We want people to communicate better. Right? There's a lot of things here that this, this is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need to change the structure in order to make that change come about by itself. It shouldn't be forced. Empower the teams says the leader that has in full control of what's going to happen next if you don't follow his thinking or his or her thinking. So I think we have to risk of making things wrong. This is where I probably differ a bit from other people here, but this uh, quote sort of says it for me. So it's structural change instead of new tools and approaches and mindsets. Another one, which I also really like, it's only when uh, when the people involved in the work uh, work out their own designs, that, that, that the necessary motivation, responsibility, and commitment to effective implementation is present. For me, that means... This has sort of become a heuristic for me now. And I've been an architect for most of my life. And I've done just that, to be honest. Of course my design is best. I'm the most experienced person in the room. I'm thinking to myself, of course, I'll never say that. <laughs> but you think that. So I think it's, if you have take one heuristic away from this, from this talk, it's this. Never, ever, ever impose the design. Because if you do that, then you're not going to get the commitment or the engagement from the people that you're imposing the design on. You want them on board with you. 
Even Akov says this, so I can, and I can explain with a good quote from him. It's absolutely essential that the people that have to implement the plan do the planning. So don't get away from that. So I think we can thrive in, 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 in complexity. This is me doing some rafting. I thought I was scared shitless until we got in the boat, because they explained how a lot of bad things could happen. It didn't, of course, but I was risking, oh, I'm going to lose my legs. Or whatever. <laughs> but it all went fine. It was wonderful. So we can do things like this in regular life, so why can't we do some stuff like this in the workplace as well? Well, we need the teams in order to do that. We need to collaborate in order to do that. And we need to, the, before, before take the Agile or whatever, we're working in that direction, we need to ground it in social sciences. We can't just pretend anymore. Look at what science tell us, tells us. Yeah, and the best way to do this, as I said, do in the, the imposing design, is that we do it participatively. So I have a strong belief in participative democracy. We are all part of democracies here, thank God, but we are part of a, rep a representative democracy. This is a participative democracy. Very different. Representative democracy is by the by a very deep one still. So I think we need to change. We, we, I mean, we, we don't need to adapt to change as much as we need to, 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 to become adaptive. That's what we need. And we can only do that as teams, not as individuals. And with that, I think I'm in time. Oh, yeah, I'm over. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry.